Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the What Did He Said podcast. Burr, 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 burr. We have the lovely Marisol. She almost forgot her name. I know. I was like, I am your host, Chingo Blingo, with the big tamarindo. And first off, shout out to all of our Patreon listeners, all of our patrons, our Patreon sponsors. If you're curious why you did not hear this episode before the Patreon people, because this is going to the Patreon people. First, so shout out to you guys. If you're curious about what the hell is this Patreon thing Chingo Bling's talking about, it's a way you can get involved and help us create exactly what you want to see more of. If you want to see a web series, you want to see an album, you want more podcasts, you want two podcasts a week, whatever it is, let us know. Go to ChingoBling.com and then click Patreon. So, this episode is brought to you by the Going Viral Tour. We kicked it off. We kicked it off. We Salt are Lake. back from Salt Lake City. Thank you guys for coming out. You guys sold it out. Thank you for having beautiful snow and lovely slopes and, and a nice bunny hill for people like me to go and it's practice. It's so pretty there. Like I said, um, my blog will drop about that this week sometime. Uh, but anyway, it's so beautiful there. I definitely don't want to live there. <laughs> But a Visit. vacation there, to own a vacation home there is definitely something I would love to have. Just because there's certain times of the year, although everyone I talked to said that doesn't matter what time of year you go, it's just constantly beautiful, which I can totally see. That I part of totally the, see. I mean, that whole area, that whole part of the country, um, I know Colorado is not right Nick and like right up on mm-hmm. Utah or anything, but like you have, that's where, that's where you get all the great outdoors. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? That's where, uh, uh, Yogi and Boo Boo, like you know, what I mean, like the geysers yeah. in Yosemite Sam, and uh, just that whole area, man. Yeah, and I believe it used to be, I it used to be Mexico. I don't know my history, but um, I had a great time snowboarding. We had a great time at the show. Shout out to Midnight and Javi Luna who wrecked the stage with me, and we kicked it off, man. You guys sold it out, Salt Lake. So we're looking forward to everything we have coming up, like Huntsville, Alabama, Nashville, Tennessee, Long Beach, California, Fresno, California, and, and let me so check, much but more. I think Fresno, no joke. What about Fresno? It's almost sold out. But and and that's good news because the, the street team, mm-hmm. the Fresno street team, is about to go hard. Um, I'm about to hit up all my contacts out there. Shout out to PDTV. Uh, shout out to Beza, uh, the uh, artist from out there. Uh, my boy Dorian Castro, he he works for the Fresno Tacos. So I need to bust out my Fresno Tacos a jersey oh, yeah. and just do a whole shout out video. R.I.P. Big Ron, you know what I'm saying? Uh, Ron Ron Senior, Bash's pop. Uh, Bash has a lot of family in Fresno. I spent a lot of time in that neck of the woods. So looking forward to that one as well. So enough about the tour. Let's talk Super Bowl and J Lo and Shakira twerk 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 twerking it up. Why are they so mad just because it was round of applause? I don't understand why they're so mad about like the controversy. About, yeah, it's so stupid. Well, I guess people <clears throat> some people feel like, hey, if you're watching the Super Bowl with your kids, and here comes Shakira flicking her tongue and J Lo hitting the hitting the pole one time and you know, which is it's a trending thing. People do Whole classes and stuff for exercise and some people see it as an art form it doesn't necessarily mean you tricking in the vip that's not necessarily what it means but um but uh super bowl was lit um you know this is how i see it for everybody that's complaining about you know j balvin bad bunny shakira and j-lo doing their thing at the end of the day man it's a business and the nfl knew exactly who they were hiring they knew they did their research before they hired these people paid them whatever they paid them accommodated them with the production they knew how influential bad bunny j balvin shakira and j-lo they know how big the demographics of latinos are so the sport if you look at uh, football a lot of parents are pulling their kids out of football so they they almost feel like they're either going to go back to leather helmets right because it's oh. supposedly safer because mm-hmm. they use the helmet as a weapon right mm-hmm. they'd be sticking each other with the uh, hard ass helmet like das and people ended up with cte like um aaron hernandez they said he was what like 23 and they looked at his brain and that his brain was already showing like just really really like damaged like it would be an older person's brain mm. um 
so anyway, it's no it's no secret that there's a lot of controversy around the sport. And for the sake of the future of the league and the future of the sport, you might want to start targeting Latinos, which they are. Because, uh, you know, they could have hired anybody. Uh, what you looking for? I, for? I can't get the password to the... I wanted to show you about the Eventbrite. But anyway, I think or, it was almost yeah. what I... I guess we'll figure that out later. Anyway, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so... Um, I guess to me it was like I don't I posted a meme yesterday where it was like Kathy from Nebraska no one cares about your opinion like mm -hmm. they killed unless it, you own they a team dominated it unless you, know you own a team or you own stock in the league or something and you know um every every art they had Bad Bunny they had J Balvin on there I mean Bad Bunny baby it was a Latino explosion up there it was a all kinds of explosions yeah so it was exploding. i think it was amazingly done um i think the ladies looked sexy in a very athletic type of way uh, yeah they because didn't have neither one of them had like boobs popping out you know what i'm saying um they're you know uh their dancing was i i felt it was Shakira kept it within her roots. She did so, have belly dancing, you know. Yeah, she's which part is part Lebanese. Yeah, exactly. Uh, J Lo killed it with her regular hip hop, just being J Lo. Doing her, her J Lo just J -Lo did her from thing. the Bronx. I mean, I'm just saying J Lo just did her. She thing. did her uptown boogie. You know, I just think like people just have nothing better to do nowadays than to complain I mean, or I, find the bad in everything. I mean, I, I kind of see it. I kind of see what, what? And, like what? not me. Not me. I'm not complaining. I had three screens. We had three TVs up. What could you possibly part. be agreeing with? I'm just kidding. No, what I mean, I didn't say agree. Did I say agree? I thought you did. No, nah, baby, you putting words in my mouth. Okay. You, you acting like you a mind reader. Well, you could, you said I can see what No, it, no, oh. what I'm saying is I'm not surprised because this is why. Everything is subjective. So you and I can look at this pencil right here and you'll have a totally different opinion about this pencil. I'm going to perceive this pencil in a totally different way. Mm -hmm. Everybody looks at everything in their own specific way so obviously if you don't know who the hell bad bunny is they're probably thinking who is this matrix dude with a do-rag you know what i'm saying jumping around jumping up and down with this little colombian girl shaking her hips and i don't understand why she flicking the tongue and where, where this little puerto rican come from now she popping it mm -hmm. you know so mm -hmm. if think about it not everybody um shit i'm sure the millennials knew they know who bad bunny is and stuff like that but there's going to be certain generations older folks or conservative people that are like that is not the nfl that i recall you know i remember when super bowl in 1973 they had you know you know the dukes of hazard were hot and they had uh you know motherfucking limp biscuit killed it or something some people wanted limp biscuit uh off subject on subject you know, a lot of times also the deaf complain because they never show the sign language interpreter as they sing the Star Ban Spangled Banner because mm -hmm. it's only the actual artist and the interpreters usually on the side just for the live, uh, audience? The live audience to see. So they're never really focused on it. Uh, Garth Brooks has been the only one um, to actually who ex actually insisted on having the interpreter right next to him while he sang because he want everybody he want all the fans which um he's trying Marley, to he's trying to he's trying to sell cds to people that can't hear okay i'm That's not a, laughing at that joke i'm not trying to be funny um marley uh I, I forget her last name who is a deaf actor uh Mighty Soul's doing research. She's I'm, pulling it I'm up. I'm about to do her last name so that I don't. She's pulling it up. Patience. Uh, Marley Matlin or Maitland. I'm not really sure how you pronounce okay. it. Okay. She's a Anyhow, deaf actress. Anyhow, she's a deaf actress who's won grand, uh, Oscar awards for, I uh, forget the name of the movie. But anyhow, she did the Star of Spangle Banner uh, for uh, one of the uh, Super Bowls when Garth Brooks sang. And she got to be right next to Garth Brooks. He insisted. He's like, well, wait a minute. Why would... What's the purpose of having her on the side? But no one can she was see. interpreting? She was the interpreter. Oh, a famous actress. Yes. Well, you know what? Shout outs to Garth for uh, looking out mm -hmm. for all communities. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it is what it is. You can't please everybody. And I think the NFL was well aware of what kind of um, discussions and controversy or whatever. You yeah. Know? I mean, I guess you're right. But I just feel like nowadays everything you know parents just want everything censored and i just kind of feel like that's a bunch of i have 
That's just a bunch of baloney. Yeah, I just don't feel like... You <laughs> That's ki- bullcorn. These kids are seeing and hearing a lot worse at school with their friends. So trust. Mm-hmm. Your little rules are not doing anything for them except forcing them to go behind your back and sneaking off to see what they can find to watch and discuss with their little friends. So... Mm-hmm. That's why Penny gonna be homeschooled. Because <laughs> she ain't gonna have them other little kids... <laughs> Influencing you know, her. Trying to, trying to talk a bunch of mess. Yeah. So enough about that. There was some other controversy. Switching subjects. Uh, Mace called out P Diddy or Puffy oh. or Diddy uh, or whatever. Well, what did he say? It's they called him out on Instagram because apparently Puffy gave a speech at some award show and he was saying something like, "Yeah, black excellence, and we need to look out for the artists and help each other out, lift each other up, like being positive." You know, I'm about we, not me. And then Mace called him out. And I'm a paraphrase. He was basically saying, like, when I was 19, you purchased my publishing off me for twenty thousand dollars, and now that I'm financially, uh, you know, better, I'm, I offered you two million to buy back my publishing. This is May speaking, and he says, but you were like, nah, talking about Diddy. You were like, nah, I'm, I'm gonna wait to see what this European dude is offering me for your publishing, and you might have to match that. So if you bought it for twenty k. I mean, off of all those songs he's written, bad, 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 bad mm-hmm. boy. Okay, you probably made your money back, you know. Uh, considering. And some. So, this is what trips me out. If he paid you $20,000 back then, back when they were spending mm, several hundred thousand dollars on a music video, I, I, I don't want to say millions, but back then, a lot of the videos did cost a million. Yeah, easily. So. Uh, you got fucked. Uh, excuse my language. And and you also said that a lot of it had to do is maybe he was desperate or in need of money to be you know to have <clears throat> accepted that amount for his his right his publishing rights right. Um, or he just didn't know. Uh, maybe he never saw a check for that amount. Mm-hmm. Um, even but, though he was making all them hits, he, you don't think he ever saw that amount of money? I uh, maybe. I mean, Damn. I, why would you take it then? I'm I'm speculating as mm. to. What possessed you? Maybe he didn't understand what publishing was, yet he sold it. You know, that's supposed to be for your kids. That's supposed to be for the next generation. That's yeah. like royalties. That's residuals. And when you sell it, you're just taking an upfront fee. Many people have sold their publishing. People who have produced mega hits. Uh, it's not wise to do. And they end up regretting it, you know, a few years later after they spend. Usually, I mean, depending on the catalog, like depending on what all hits and songs you have under your publishing Mm -hmm. it's gonna be worth more so even if they give you 10 million or something i mean depending on what songs it is you might be thinking like oh man they don't even play that song on the radio no more fuck yeah let me sell it well guess what that song then came back yeah and now you like sitting there looking like boo boo the fool looking like rudy (laughs) Pooh, talking about oh man so the moral of the story is this If you're in the music business, I don't give a damn if you're 19, 18, 17, 15, or 45. Read read some books. Do some research, especially these days. Educate yourself. Like, when I jumped in the game, I had to buy a book called This Business of Music by um, a a dude named Passman. I forget the first name, like Ronald Passman or something. They got it at every bookstore, This Business of Music, and it has chapter after chapter after chapter breaking down these contracts. Because I was having to educate myself because... These labels, including Diddy, were starting to reach out. So a lot of people trip out like, man, why, why did uh, this might be the Diddy story? Mm. Like, why did you turn down the bad boy Latino deal? Mm. That was exposure. That could have blew you up. What if? What if? What if? But it's like at that point in time, I followed my gut. I didn't want to take it. And where is bad boy Latino now? Mm. Can name me an artist that is on bad boy Latino. Name me a release. Name me a CD that they put out. I think they put out a couple, but, but do, who, who was do you know? Well, who was that? I don't know. That? It's oh. somebody that Emilio Estefan was developing because here goes the tea. Uh, Pitbull. Grab your tea, guys. Get Grab your tea, your tea right Everybody now. Get He's your about little, to spill uh, it. Cheese get your little drink. The simultaneous sip. All right, so Pitbull. Uh, I'm not saying he gave Diddy the idea, but he was encouraging Diddy to jump into the Latin world, which many people were like, Mm. even Wu-Tang had like Wu-Tang Latino. Everybody named mom had a Latin division. Like 
fucking Def Jam Latino. Everybody named Mom had like this stepchild boutique side label where it was like you might not have access to all the staff and the resources. Mm-hmm. Cause, so in other words, when I was dealing with Puffy, it's like, okay, am I going to be on Bad Boy, Bad Boy, which is distributed? You know, I forget who was distributing them at the time, but they had resources like Am I going to be on the same labels, 112, Mace, mm-hmm. Faith, and Biggie? Or am I on some new experiment you're doing with Emilio Estefan because, mm-hmm. because Pitt Bull told you this is the guy. Like Pitt was trying to put together a situation to help artists like me and so that he can get a little bit of a executive game time because mm-hmm. at the time I think he was tied into uh, TVT Records. So basically Diddy ran with the idea the day of the MTV Awards in Miami, you know, me, Pitbull, and his crew, I was the plus one. We're in the, we're in the audience, like, because uh, Pitt had just finished helping um, linking up Lil John with Daddy Yankee because Gasolina was starting to buzz in Latin America and the Caribbean. So, Lil John, I, so I was hearing this thing where Lil John used to work for So So Deaf. Jermaine mm-hmm. Dupree for 12 years in A&R and producer and so when Little John was trying to tell like Jermaine Dupree like listen I want to be Little John yeah. like I can do this yeah. shit right he was like nah bro you like, probably didn't see him like that. like you're not ready for that and so it took him 12 years of working with so so deaf and like just as an A&R that's mm-hmm. all he was and then he was like, yeah, I can't do this anymore. I need to go off on my own. This was, That was the era where uh, So So Dev was putting out like Atlanta booty music, mm-hmm. which they borrowed from Miami. That sound mm-hmm. came from Miami. Uh, Pimp C called him out on that mm-hmm. when he was calling out Atlanta. So Little John was producing. Do you remember those So So Dev like bass compilations where it was like Freak Nick and it was like, it was all like, it was all that that same little tempo. So Lil John branched off on his own and started putting out Crunk Records, mm-hmm. which is a style of music heavily inspired by Memphis, you know, gangster shit. So anyway, back to the story. Pitbull was campaigning, trying to get a situation going with Diddy. Pitbull even lined up. Um, and this is from my, from what I saw, right? He lined up um, a release party at Bongo's, which is uh, Emilio Stefan and his Club. wife, mm-hmm. Gloria Stefan's big club in miami so i was there diddy was there pitbull was there. everybody was there and it was a big launch party pitbull also lined up a radio interview so diddy can go get on there and promote the event and talk about this new label mm. and i first of all I'm a, I'm a huge diddy fan just from like just from being a kid like not only the music but just people like executives people like jay prince you know looking at what russell simmons Lear Cohen and, and um, Rick Rubin created out of New York with Def Jam and Jermaine Dupri. Like, I studied all these people. Master P, I'm a nerd for all that shit. Tony Draper. So we're in this um, radio station studio, and which Pitbull, that's his hometown. He lined it all up so that Diddy can come up there. Mm-hmm. And, and uh, Kevin Lyles was outside uh, in the Phantom, in the Rolls Royce. And uh, Diddy, I, that's when I got to witness firsthand the gift of gap, where... Diddy was tap dancing. Like, basically, he's a salesman. So his whole interview was, like, selling it like it was already a thing, like, bad boy Latinos coming. And I'm in there, but I'm not signed to him. So I'm I'm just there, mm. you know. I, they, I think they let me get on the mic for a second. And that's when I got to talk my shit for about 15 seconds. Mm-hmm. And di- so Diddy could peep game. Like, oh, mm. okay, this dude can hold his own on the mic yeah. or whatever. So, so f- we're at the MTV Awards, right? Pitbull had also hooked up uh, Daddy Yankee with Lil Jon. And some some artists complain, like I've heard Nori and Fat Joe complain that Daddy Yankee, he don't seem too appreciative, that they helped him with uh, putting him on um, uh, Oye Mi Canto. Like mm-hmm. everyone feels like they had some hand in helping him cross over in America. Gasolina was going to be a smash regardless. Yeah, for but, sure. But when Pitbull put him with Lil John and they did a little remix together. Gasolina, Gasolina. And that Lil John stamp and that Pitbull stamp, it just gave it a different little feel mm. where it's like, oh, this this isn't just a dude from Puerto Rico doing some like super Latin shit. Like he's coming to cross over. 
And so now we're at the MTV Awards and Pip's kind of like, man, why, where the hell is Daddy Yankee at, man? I thought we were supposed to be, you know what I mean? Like, okay, well, I don't know what's going on. Here comes Daddy Yankee. Boom, got soul. He's out there. Who's dancing up next to, who's dancing all around Daddy Yankee? Puff Daddy. Puff Daddy. <laughs> so here come Puff Daddy doing his shit to get a little bit of the sauce because he's always been like a hype man. You know, he was always dancing next to Biggie mm-hmm. or da- dancing next to Mace. That's what he does. He he tends to make situations like hotter. Like he has the golden touch, you know? He can take a failing vodka and turn it into a premium thing mm-hmm. that everybody wants to rap about and it rhymes with shit, Ciroc. So he made a shit ton of money off that. Um, So the picture I'm trying to paint, let's just say we left a little bit early. Mm-hmm. <laughs> the MTV Awards in Miami, which I got to walk the red carpet uh, thanks to uh, Pitbull. And right before I walked the red carpet in Miami at the MTV Awards, Master P called. Mm. And he's like, uh, it was actually a producer, uh, Mike uh, Mike Diesel. He produced Knocking Doors Down. That burn, mm-hmm. burn, knocking doors down. So I had connected with Mike Diesel and he's like, hey, Chingo, Master P wants to holler at you. He's looking for new artists, right? He's always hustling. And I'm like, oh shit, Master P, this is one of my heroes. Mm-hmm. Like, pfft. And Master P's like, hey, man, what's going on? You know, what, what you got going on? Where you at? Or whatever. Sure. Honest answer. I'm in Miami. I'm about to walk the red carpet at the MTV Awards. <laughs> so he is How long did that conversation last after that? Bye. All right, cool, man. Well, check this out. I'm looking for hungry up-and-comers. It sounds like you got too much going on right now. And I'm like, ah, wait, 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 Percy, Master P, we, 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 we can still be friends. <laughs> like, we can do something. Like, this, I'm the plus but one. But you didn't have a lot going on. Or um, you did. Nah, I mean, I was like buzzing in the underground. I was based out of Texas. Um, so did you not have time to explain that? I would have explained that. Like, I'm here as a guest, but uh, it was over can we quick. Talk? I mean, in hindsight, this is how I recall it. I'm sure he probably don't probably don't even remember the damn call. Uh, but uh, anyway, the situation I'm trying to explain is bad boy Latino, which is, you know, Diddy probably thought, all right, well, Emilio Stefan is this big, major Latin producer. He's got the golden touch. I don't know if Pitbull introduced them, but somehow, some way, it was a P. Diddy, Emilio Stefan type of joint venture collaboration. Mm. Pitbull was not any longer involved. involved. Oh, shit. You see what I'm saying? Uh-huh. So, it's people dancing on stage that, you know, some people feel like, well, shit, dog, damn, okay, my bad, well, what's going on? Yeah. And, damn, oh, shit, there goes Diddy, the guy that I just took to the radio station, lined up an event, gave him an idea for a label, and even tried to introduce him, his first fucking artist. Yeah. And they're up there dancing, you know? So, I mean, it is what it is, but later, fast forward, because when we first met Diddy, uh, Pitbull was like, hey... We're going to go meet them. They're shooting a video for uh, Boys in the Hood in Atlanta. Um, Fly in, whatever, whatever. We met them on the tour bus. And um, I'm holding my little bobblehead at the time, right? Because I'm up there in in my little getup. And Pitbull's talking to him like, man, is there any way you can, like, get me out of my contract? Mm. And he's like, man, once you sign that paper, man, it's kind of hard to get you out. But the whole time, he's just kind of, like, chewing on a toothpick. And he's just... Like glancing at the Bible head, glancing at me, glancing at the Bible, listening to Pit, looking at the Bible, looking at the boots. And he's like, is that you? I was like, yeah, it's me. Let me see it. And he looked at it and he's just like, <laughs> like a little giggle or whatever. I was like, oh, I brought some for your kids because his kids were on, on the bus and shit playing. They're grown now. Now they're rapping. <clears throat> but um, next time I saw him in Houston when he did the uh, white party event and he was really trying to lock me in on paper. He was like, yeah, man, my kids are destructive. Like, they broke the Bible or that you gave them or whatever. And uh, he, here's, here's the funny part. I've to, I think I've told this story before, but you're getting it right here. Patreon people get it first. What did he say podcast? Um, Pitt planted a little seed in Diddy's head. He was like, because Pitt and Lil John are like super tight. They're super close. So Lil John went along with this little white line, mm. which was... Hey, John, if anybody asks, <clears throat> Diddy, you're trying to sign Chingo. If anybody asks. Oh, all right, yeah, I'm de- for, yeah, cool. Got it. So he told Diddy, hey, man, you might want to get on this quick because um, actually, you know what? Pitbull s- set up like three different signing situations. 
oh it was a tough decision like he tried to uh hook me up with jim johnson who had this label under atlantic um uh, called rebel rock they mm -hmm. signed bob uh and, and jim johnson's a huge producer but when we all sat in that meeting in miami you know pitbull shows up i'm at one side of the table jim johnson and his lawyers are there and we're looking at the paper and it's like hmm the advance the artist advance is fifty thousand. okay so this is a starter like uh we're gonna develop you from scratch you ain't got shit going mm. on you ain't got no fan that's that's your starter entry level deal and so we turned it down even pitt even pitt when he saw it he was like oh uh, man uh guys almost kind of like this Come is on, not yeah. yeah this is not what like mm -hmm. it, it's gonna be a no yeah so i'm sure he i'm sure he understood he might have got pitt might have got frustrated after a while like okay chingo's just not fucking signing anything but i'm sure he's got to understand at least these two situations mm -hmm. uh which is the rebel rock first offer and then um uh, so the p diddy one i wanted i wanted my masters that was going to be impossible from diddy because at the time he didn't even own his master mm. he had to buy them back later i wanted creative control it's probably not gonna happen with somebody mm. with most labels especially with you know somebody that's trying to protect the bad boy brand they're not going to just let some artist do whatever the fuck they want to do so his answer to that was kind of like uh that's something that can be shared but lingo for shared is this uh, on my contract people when somebody says they're willing to share creative control this is really what they mean it means this um yes we can discuss ideas yes we can collaborate we'll consider your yeah, ideas but if there is ever let's just say a difference of opinion or anything like that it's gonna go our way mm. so let's just say it's not a 50 50 creative control it's more like 51 49 so guess what does that really fucking mean bitch you ain't got creative fucking control right. and then so the deal that i ended up signing with asylum records they gave me my masters they gave me creative control i mean everything else you would want an advance mm -hmm. a marketing budget mm -hmm. I mean, they twisted my arm. It was a deal I couldn't refuse. Mm -hmm. Like, I was like, I almost didn't want to sign with anybody. I really didn't. Because I'm like, oh, fuck, what else can I ask for? So they could just tell me no. So the last thing was um, uh, the guy I had signed with was a, a dude, the president, Todd Moskowitz, the president of Asylum. Uh, ho hopefully this isn't boring to y'all. This is like inside baseball. <laughs> but anyway, he was in some award show when we called to tell him this last request. And then we'll switch subjects. Um, well, no, I, because to be honest with you, that kind of ties in even with so now with your comedy, yeah. you with the very beginning, you were approached by several agents, agents, agencies, agencies. Mm -hmm. uh, you know what I'm saying? Some would just uh, sporadically sh pop up without, you know, letting so. anyone, anyone know you were going to come. Um, and I'm just going to tell this story and I'm not going to say who it was or whatever or, or what agency it was. But it's funny. um, for those of you that don't know, um, I sometimes uh, control the music uh, at the shows. And so, you know, I have to kind of pay attention. Um, I had to pay attention to what's happening, you know, to what's, uh, you know what I'm saying? To like the time, uh, the times, who's up cetera, next, who's up intro next. song. So I'm like, I'm focused, you know what I'm saying? Because I'm looking at the clock. I'm making sure that everything is running smooth, et cetera. And then, you know, uh, one of the, guys from the t from an the agent. agents an agent came by Who and happened to be in town right happened to be in town with a big name person which they yeah. happened to name drop yeah and then they were there and it, and i thought it was funny because um so listen guys just real quick i guess if you follow me on social media you never ever ever see me brag about some bag I got or some name brand shit I have. It's not my personality. I really don't care. You don't need to know what I purchase. So if I have it and you see it in a video and then you ask me, hey, what brand is that? I'll let you know. But I'm not going to sit there and be like, oh, did you Basically, see, you see my new? So anyway, you're not going to buy me with material items. I've, I've always been able to purchase so he tried to use some bait. He tried to use some bait by saying, um, all my clients' wives uh, <laughs> carry Louis Vuitton bags. And I just kind of looked at my... And they got big houses. Yeah, big houses. I keep, and, the, I keep the husbands on the road. Yeah, and, and then basically, like, you drive 
a Mercedes. Uh, first of all, don't nobody want to drive a Mercedes. No offense to, if you drive one, but I'm okay because we are debt free and our cars are nice. And I used to have Mercedes, and it gave me a couple problems. But so. yeah, um, so you know, cars don't impress me. Number one, two, a person doesn't impress me either because I had a Louis Vuitton sitting right there behind him, and I just laughed and I said. Well, I can purchase a Louis Vuitton. It's literally right there. You, you pointed know, it out? I pointed it. I'm like, it's right yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like uh, they, they they wear the best and Louboutin shoes. Okay, well, yeah, there's like two in my closet right now that I've not worn because uh, guess what? I buy high heels and then I really don't ever wear them because I'm in tennis shoes 99% of the time. So it was like I had an answer for everything as he was trying to impress me. But I thought it was funny that he was there, right? T- because he had been harassing us we weren't we weren't kind of getting back to him um, we weren't that interested we weren't that interested to be honest with you guys um so so one thing that you know um you're, you're very credited for is you know you and your sister uh worked together in the very beginning of your career um and y'all have stayed independent and family uh run the entire time you've continued to do that with the um touring part or you know the comedy part of it as well to where we did all the legwork you guys have zero idea like how i was a bugaboo to like these comedy clubs so that they could get chingo in because no one knew who chingo was it was a confusion for them it's like wait chingo the rapper like that's if they even knew that yeah it was like what just... does he what does he want you got to remember comedy is something that is very like um old school a lot of the places now are getting up to up to like hip and more to the social media where they're using they're allowing social media uh comedians or uh acts to actually come into the improv yeah, and perform and youtubers etc while back then that was you would that would have never been heard of so it was a lot of work um, especially for someone who came from no entertainment background um, to try to sell someone and, you know what I'm saying, uh, try to get us in there, which we did. We did all the work. And so for an agency to try to come in and say, I'm going to give you this, well, wait, we're already doing it. Why would we hire you guys to do what we're already doing and not or, pay the fee. Or they'll be it's like, a large, it's a, it's a hefty P, or a P, uh, fee. Or they'll be like, well, the percentage you're getting, I can get you 10 more percent. And I'm like, well, yeah, that's your okay, 10%. Hold on, hold on. So once you give me that percent, let's say you give me an extra 10%. Awesome. But then I'm going to owe you what? 10%. So I'm back to what? The motherfucking price I'm getting now. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and here's the thing, too. You know, I, I see the comments when people are like, man, Chingo need to be up there with Kevin Hart doing movies, or Chingo need to audition for this movie or that, or why you ain't on uh, Adult Swim, why you ain't got a show on E Network, whatever the fuck, right? Why you ain't got a movie on this and that. Okay, well, one thing that these agents agencies try to, I guess, promise, or one of the things they attempt to do for you is like, all right, we're going to hook you up with like a showrunner and you guys are going to come up with like a show concept. Maybe we could pitch it to like Fox or somebody. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a sitcom. Maybe it's a sketch show like Nick Cannon, uh, uh, Wild and Out. Maybe we could pitch that to VH1 or whatever, right? That's kind of in theory what you're getting when you sign on with, a, with an agency. However, one thing that is guaranteed is that I'm going to pay them a cut. They're going to get their money. For sure. That's guaranteed. Mm-hmm. You know what ain't guaranteed? You getting picked up for some motherfucking show yeah. or that the other department, like let's say the comedy agents are pitching you to clubs and theaters to get a cut from what you already built up. Uh, but these other departments, whether it's like liter- literary, like we, you want to put out a book, Chingo, or you want to you know, pitch your show, none of that is guaranteed. It's very slim to none. So there's your answer as to, hey, Chingo, why you ain't in this and that? Well, because for one, I'm going to have to sign up with these people and hope that they can make it do what it do. And then they get a percentage of and all everything while, yeah, that every, you're doing. They Not a, just that particular I, thing they're signing you up for. They now become the manager of your entire brand. Every which means entertainment getting, dollar. Which means they're getting a cut from T-shirts, everything. T-shirts, hats. So I think it's cool that the fans get to hear this part. Um, we might fuck around, make this a Patreon exclusive, or maybe they'll just get this first. But I think it's cool if they learn about this aspect of aspect of the business because 
you know, in case they're a fan of someone else or myself or whoever, they can kind of understand the economics of how shit works and all the moving pieces behind the scenes so that you don't get frustrated at your favorite artist. Like, man, why you ain't blah, 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 blah. Mm -hmm. And it's like, okay, mm -hmm. bro, do I really want to up and leave, go to LA, you know, be in fucking auditions every day, you know, just to, j just to get some little part in some little movie that don't even pay much. Um, or and obviously if the if the opportunity came it would you you're not going to 100 percent decline but you're definitely going to we're, we're definitely doing the research we're definitely yeah. doing you know weighing the pros and cons is this beneficial to you how does it fit the brand is it great for the mm -hmm. brand you know there's a lot of things that we take in consideration for anything um that's S of that nature yeah so this is the point i was trying to make but i got sidetracked so so what i was saying is it's dope for the fans to understand this part of the game because there are people who take a percentage of every entertainment dollar in. So, for example, pretend you're a fan of Mighty Soul and you've been seeing her pay her dues and, and put in work grassroots style um, from the jump. Like, you're there from the beginning. Like, man, I was following Mighty Soul when she only had 15,000 followers on Instagram or I was there from her third vlog. Mm -hmm. Okay, if you if you feel that way about somebody... Keep in mind that if you, if they feel pressured to flip up their game plan to go and chase this thing that everybody wants uh, to um, get them to do because it'll validate them, then this is what's happening. You know those shirts that you love that your favorite artist sells and those, mm -hmm. and man, I love those hats Mighty Soul put out. I'm just going to use that as an example. I love when she does her like women conference, you know, gatherings, her meet and greets or this product or that product. Well, now... Now, look at it this way. That same $10 item of this, you're so humble, you're so down to earth. Now, that's going to a big company in Hollywood. So what I'm trying to say is this. If you follow somebody that is independent and is grassroots, first of all, all my Patreon people, they're already putting their money where the mouth is, right? Mm -hmm. They're already pitching in. So what I'm saying is if you follow an independent artist and you respect their hustle, you respect their grind, you respect their craft and their art and the songs or whatever, the sketches, whatever it is they do, um, support them so that, you know, they don't get in this situation where it's like, well, fuck, man, maybe I do need to go where the grass is greener. Mm -hmm. Maybe I do need to go chase this thing that everybody's telling me to chase because my people don't really understand the sacrifices or yeah. my people don't understand who's trying to get into my pockets so if you if you have if you're a fan of somebody independent help keep them independent because independent is the shit you know you're able to move a certain way you're able to make moves when you want to you're able to put out what you want how you want when you want the way you want you know what i'm saying there's nobody there telling you like you can't use that language in your book or hey we saw your documentary we're not too crazy about the middle Mm. It's like you starting to have to take everybody's opinion. And then what happens? Now y'all start calling the artists a sellout. Mm -hmm. oh, I remember when you used to just get on YouTube and act a fool. Okay, well, support the foolishness. <laughs> if not, they're going to start tr looking for where the grass is greener yeah, and start sure. paying motherfuckers. Start paying middle people yeah. and shit. So, mm -hmm. excuse my language. Uh, but, we, you know, we gave y'all a couple cool stories. Uh, I, I know we do have to run shortly. You want Yeah. You got another topic or uh, no, no, no. I was just that that was basically what I was going to say is, you know, um, sometimes uh, it's the grass is not always greener uh, on the other side, you know, because there's so much more involved. It rarely in, ever is, you know, <laughs> unless unless I remember, I, I think I always have these questions for you when I see like someone like Cardi B or Migos. I always ask you like, OK, I know that you say it's a really difficult thing mm -hmm. to kind of, you know, there's like there's so many variables because i'll ask you like how are they able to do this or how are they able to that. do that you know what i'm I'll saying so something. like uh yeah go ahead so you're you're you using examples like cardi b and migos um i would call those outliers meaning if you have a hundred data points mm -hmm. on a graph those two are like Phew. i mean if you look at hip-hop as a let's just say hip-hop as a billion dollar business mm -hmm. a nice percentage of market share goes to quality control entertainment quality control entertainment is southern rap which is these days pretty fucking pop mm -hmm. 
-hmm. it's damn near i would argue 50 percent of hip-hop the other the other half is going to be split between your midwest texas west coast new york and Mm -hmm. maybe international but like southern trap is probably half of the fucking market a multi-billion dollar business out of that half what percentage does Migos and, and mother shit Cardi B's from New York, but she be rapping on South Beats mm. half the time. A lot of New York rappers have had to. Uh, I, I was I was in the game and I was peeping when I would hear motherfuckers in New York complain about all these Southern people. But at the same time, they were liking it. And, you know, it's, it's a nice exchange because mm-hmm. for the longest people down south had no choice but to rap, but to uh, jam east coast or west coast music because mm-hmm. our scene was still very young like rap a lot helped establish southern rap especially texas rap houston uh, more than anything um but to answer your question as to like well fuck it, it's almost like an unfair comparison because it's like well i'm just going to reference two of the hottest people in the game yeah, yeah, yeah you know because cardi is getting all those endorsements First of all, shout out to her personality. Yeah. Shout out to her team. I mean, she was born with charisma and she's obviously really good That's at what she she's does. She's a Libra. <clears throat> I mean, she's obviously really good at what she does. She's a great performer. She makes songs better, I would argue. Like yeah. the Bruno Mars song, uh, Damn Me, Baby. Mm-hmm. If she wasn't on it, mm, that might be one you skip on a CD. But they, they drilled it on the radio. They played it on the radio. Mm-hmm. They put Cardi on it it's a smash yeah yeah it went from because what was his first single the one that came out before that um i don't know somebody in the car screaming it like it's uh, whatever that first single was Damn, 24 ca- was 24 oh carat yeah yeah it's also a hit that's all bruno uh it's a smash hit but who was who who was jamming tell me the original version that if you go on the album it ain't the it's first not, the first no, pressing yeah, yeah, yeah. the first pressing ain't got cardi on it so you heard 24 carat you peeping his album it doesn't really stand out I, I just heard like okay they got some little teddy riley new jack swing type of production going on and with that one they took it kind of like silk jodeci 90s mm-hmm. they took it 90s r&b big time but once they put cardi on it because she's a star and uh i'm sure Nicki minaj has paid notice She's noticed that it came and ate the lunch. She hopped in the game. So, obviously, man, you have to shout out. They have the same manager. Migos and Cardi B have uh, Coach K, who used to manage Jeezy first when he did that Snowman campaign. Mm. Uh, Trap or Die, when he had the mixtapes, and uh, when Jeezy really made it on the scene. They fell out. Then he went to manage Gucci which Gucci man who happened to have beef with Jeezy and they had a, a hit single together. So icy. So I met coach K That's my jam. That's the jam jam and a half. I met coach K in Puerto Rico during mix show power summit, which was a industry thing that was like where the DJs can hang with the artists and you can hopefully get your song played on more mm-hmm. stations. So Jeezy was out there. Jeezy was a new artist. He was a nobody. He Jeezy was sitting there telling me, I didn't know who the fuck he was. He was sitting there telling me, uh, I got two record deals. I have a group deal that I'm in. US, uh, what is it called? USD? No, um, Bad Boys or some shit. Uh, whatever the fuck it's called. It's under Bad Boy. And then I have a solo uh, deal with Def Jam. And I'm like, who the fuck are you again? And how do you have two fucking record deals? Mm. Well, fast forward about six months, I started hearing this mixtape. And I was like, damn, this shit is jamming. And I never put two and two together. Because later at the white party, Diddy was like, hey, man, you want to meet Jeezy? I'm like, fuck yeah, I want to meet Jeezy. Trap or die. This is the hot DJ drama. And him put out the hottest fucking mixtape out at the time. Everybody had the snowman shirts. So I'm like, oh, what's up, man? He's like, what's up, Chingo? He's like, yeah, Puff. I met him in Puerto Rico. How you been? And I'm like, oh, shit. My brain was like. Uh-huh. Then I put two and two together like, oh, I did meet you. And that's when I met Coach K. We were all on a bus. They were taking us from the resort mm. to uh, one of the events that was off campus, if mm. you will. And uh, I just chopped it up with him. And I was, I was like, oh, okay, so you're a manager. Interesting. You manage Jeezy? Wow, okay. And that was it. And then fast forward, I'm like, oh, this dude that I see managing Migos and Cardi B, he helped start Quality Control Entertainment. Mm. And I'm like, oh, shit. No wonder. This is, this is a bad motherfucker. So I would kill, last thing. I would kill to like be a little intern or something over there, like roll with Coach K and just 
peep game like how do you delegate what is your fucking workflow like who answers to you and who has access to you like who's able to call you and text you like how do you delegate your time and your day how are you managing everything because he must have junior managers under him because who's on the road with Migos are you on a road with them or who's working on this MTV Awards thing that Cardi has to be on I I was just watching that uh, Scooter Braun or however you pronounce his last Mm -hmm. name his little thing about you know how he came about or whatever and i guess he was just like a little marketing genius Mm. because that's kind of how he kind of kicked off his little thing and um technically he was the one that discovered bieber it wasn't usher like everyone thinks it is Mm. now uh what he did was he told usher if you can get me this deal with um to uh this meeting set up so that they can hear bieber right then you're part of the deal. So if it goes through, not like set yeah, it up, it yeah, goes yeah. through, now you're partner also. So long story short, you know what I'm saying? It went through. That's how a shirt uh, sure, uh, was part of it. What, what, I wonder what they gave him. Did they give him um, percentage points? I'm not there yet. Uh, mm. I'm not finished with the, with the little interview, but I'm it was really it. interesting because um, – Jermaine Dupree, he worked for Jermaine Dupree for... Scooter a, did? Scooter wow. did. That's how he got in the game. So he actually was a little boy who decided he was going to go to Emory? Or Emory. 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 I don't know. Uh, what do you call it? In, uh, in Georgia. Mm-hmm. And he really didn't know what he was going to do, but he started making fake IDs. And so then he would go under this fake name, right? And he said he was kind of feeling like... He had told the friend who they kind of partnered up with, like, hey, let's work together. You know how to make these, but I know how to sell them to people. So let's be, get partners. But they had both agreed, like, you don't tell anybody our names because if any we were to get busted, we don't want it to come back to us. Right. Well, he goes to a party he and the guy that his partner is, is a bunch of girls there. Well, one of the girls came up to him and knew him by the first name. Ooh. So then he was like, yeah, it's time for me to exit mm. here. So he was kind of like telling, so he basically said, we are no longer partners. Like, I'm out of this. I'm not doing this anymore. And he said, like, literally two weeks later, the friend got busted. Mm. Uh, Like, uh, and so anyway, so he got busted. And so that was the end of that. So then he started kind of promoting. He went to the clubs and was like, hey, how much would you pay me if I can bring people to your club? Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And so then he became a kind of like a club promoter. Mm-hmm. Well, then uh, uh, like a well-known um, actor in Georgia showed up to one of the parties and it was like, oh shit. And so then he, that actor introduced him to more people. And then, so he just kind of kept go- getting people. Well, then Jermaine Dupree, he met Jermaine Dupree and he was hanging out with all these celebrities, et cetera. Jermaine Dupree basically said, hey, I want you to come work with me for, Mm. you know, come work for me. So he worked for him for a while as this little like nobody. But then he immediately like a month later became like the marketing uh, director because he was so good at his little game. You know what he Mm -hmm. did? And so then he worked there for a long time. At So So Deaf. At So So Deaf. Right. And he worked there for a long time. And every time he had a marketing plan, um, Jermaine Dupri didn't want for people to know who he was because he was they were afraid that they'd want to hire him mm-hmm. to work for their for them. Mm-hmm. So he would sit down with Jermaine Dupri, go through the entire marketing plan that they had, and then he'd take that paper and go present it and never introduce him to anyone mm-hmm. because mm-hmm. they didn't want to know. So people started finding out who he was and then they was like, Oh, they came to him for consultations mm-hmm. and so forth. Anyhow, what happened was the mom is involved in Jermaine Dupri's business as well. So Mm. one day she comes and she kind of is bashing everybody at the office talking about y'all wouldn't be shit. Basically not in those words. He didn't use those words, but basically he, what he basically said was y'all ain't doing, you know, y'all wouldn't be shit if it wasn't for my son, y'all taking advantage of him, blah, 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 blah. And so he was like, I would very politely because that is the mother of, you know, of Jermaine Dupri. I'm not going to disrespect her, you know? I'm going to not... Wait, wait, wait. The mother of Jermaine Dupree? Yeah. She was bashing? Yes. Jermaine Dupree's mom was bashing all of Jermaine's the employees? The little employees, and, yeah. And praising Scooter? No. Was praising she, Jermaine? Jermaine, oh, yeah. Okay. Talking about y'all work for my son, uh-huh. Jermaine Dupree, yeah. you know, and y'all over here, you know what I'm saying? Y'all wouldn't be shit if it wasn't for him. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So then he was like, no, I disagree. Like, don't make us feel this way. So he kind of left and mm-hmm. didn't like... She said, whatever he said, he says, I, 
I will not repeat what she said, but she insulted all of us. And then after that, he leaves, goes to hang out with Jermaine Dupri that night, like nothing, right? He didn't say anything. He's like, for to you know, for out of respect for you, out of respect for Jermaine Dupri, I'm just gonna go and take the rest of the day off because what you just said has been very, you know, offensive, blah, blah, blah. Takes off that night, parties with Jermaine Dupri. Mm -hmm. Next morning, he goes to cool off, you know, mm -hmm. has a night, whatever. Comes back the next morning, there's a letter on his desk basically saying you're being let go, mm -hmm. you're fired. Mm -hmm. Signed by the mom, mm -hmm. right? Wow. But then he looks over and it's also signed by Jermaine Dupri. And mm -hmm. he was like, bro, we just hung out last night. Mm -hmm. Like... And made a whole marketing plan. Like, how the fuck are you just going to fire me? He's like, man, just let it die down for like two weeks. Let two weeks pass by and blah, blah, blah. So then he was like, and that's when I knew like, fuck, I just put like all these years into this company. That how many years was he there? I forgot what he said. I wonder what artists they were putting out at the time. Um, so... Oh, who was Just it? Just to get a time Yeah, frame. I forgot. But anyway, what he said was little John gave him great advice. Mm -hmm. And he said, whatever you do, he's like, all this energy that you're putting, you know what I'm saying? Don't spend it all if this is on, on, on someone else's company, unless this is yours. He's mm -hmm. like, don't make them the same mistake I did, which mm -hmm. I stayed here for 12 years until mm -hmm. I decided that wow. it was time for me to explore. So, but anyway. Tidbit. Uh, one time, Ludacris' mom who happened to have been sitting next to me at, a, at an event where Jermaine Dupri and Ludacris were both uh, presenters along, um, not panel members along with myself. And when they were introducing Jermaine Dupri, <laughs> Luda's mom leans over and whispers to me. I don't even know who she even knew who the fuck I was. She's like, what is he going to teach us about? Because uh, it was a financial responsibility uh, thing. Mm. And she was like, what's he going to teach us? Remember to pay your taxes? <laughs> Because do you know that he got in big trouble? Jermaine Dupri had a big scandal with his taxes. Mm. So, so he was one of the first artists on MTV Cribs. He was one of the first artists showing off Bentleys and Rolls Royces. Mm. I had never heard of a Bentley. A lot of people had never heard of Bentleys. It was just some fucking British luxury. And they car. said that he won a lot of Quincy Jones's records. He broke like records that Quincy Jones only had like reached. Oh, he, he broke that the he record. broke a lot of his records well he put out some fire ass shit yeah he had a, a, i didn't even uh, know he had done mariah carey's the some of the songs emancipation of mimi oh did the whole album yeah i had mm. no idea about that yeah he the one that had we belong together yeah i think so because if you listen to the beat it's straight up jamie dupree but now but but then uh that scooter guys worked with kanye mm -hmm. like managing him too that's where i'm at right mm -hmm. now in the little video and that's where so. we're at so, so with that being said gave y'all some inside scoop hope y'all got some uh, good knowledge from this entertainment business and how fucking rough it is yeah let us let us know if y'all like this kind of it's a little inside baseball but if you dig it and you like hearing little stories and you know it might sound like i'm dropping names and shit but all that shit is true um again see you guys on the road man going viral tour has kicked off in a major fucking way sold out salt lake we're headed to fresno long beach huntsville alabama nashville tennessee phoenix arizona so 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 many more so so deaf and also shout out to the patreoners man all my patrons appreciate the love you guys are putting your money where your mouth is supporting Thank independent you. supporting an independent situation we got going we've been independent since the beginning uh for a little while like i told y'all I, I had a little deal with asylum and you live and you learn you, you know it was it was like a marriage it was like a relationship and if you guys listen to this and you guys have questions we can do a part two so maybe Q and send, a. send your questions and maybe chingo can answer them like you know like anything you guys are curious about or if you're someone who is interested in getting into the entertainment business and you have questions you know send them in and you know part two could be it so all right guys y'all have a good day appreciate the love we'll talk to you soon peace, peace.